Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced by North Idaho College located on Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. We're very pleased to bring you a two-week series on the subject, cross-country snowmobile racing. It's really gaining popularity around the United States and uh, certainly in <clears throat> recent months, in the last few years uh, here in the West. In order to discuss this topic, which is the first time for us on this particular topic, uh, we welcome to the program, and very pleased to do so, Travis Lowe. Our guest is a race driver in the Rocky Mountain cross-country racing circuit. Uh, our guest is a student at North Idaho College, and uh, I've known Travis for some time, and after talking with him about uh, this exciting sport, he's agreed to come and do the two programs. And he's also brought some video that we'll be showing both programs for you who, like myself, have not uh, observed in person uh, this type of racing. And he has also has some of the gear with him. Uh, Travis, welcome to the program. We're very Thank pleased you. to have you here. Uh, uh, Travis, uh, when you and I I've met on this on several occasions, even over lunch, we've talked about uh, this whole sport. And the first thing I'd like for you to do for our audience to get us uh, started is to talk about particularly the Rocky Mountain Cross Country Racing Circuit. And I believe there are different um, categories and, and how you qualify for those. So just kind of give us a description of how the whole system is set up. Okay, it's, uh, it's set up according to uh, what level you think you're, you know, capable of racing um, as far as the sport level which is usually the beginners it's trophies only um, less laps you know no payback and then you move up to the semi-pro level and that gets 75 percent payback and that's more of your two three year into racing you you've know. been doing it two or three years yeah exactly and then um, your third is the pro division and that's Mainly the veterans, you know, the, the ones that know exactly what's going on. and They've been at it for some time. Yeah, exactly, real good As at what As it says, the pros are the, are the top yeah. racers. Now, in relation to the pros, they uh, financially, they're also rewarded more, is that right? Yeah, they get 100% payback, and as far as if they get a sponsorship from a factory, the, the factories will pay them according to how they finish at certain races. And so they can actually make money on it if they have good sponsors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you say 75% payback, that is whatever is charged to enter the races, you get 75% of that back if you're what, a winner? Or? Yeah, 75%. And then they divvy that up. Um, sometimes the top three positions, and I've been at races where they've paid back to the top 10 before. Depending on how many entries they have, they'll pay back farther. When they say 75% back, they pay each one of those 75% no, or just a 75 total? No, 75% of what... Um, is taken in. Yeah, exactly. They'll pay back. Mm -hmm. And uh, now you, as I indicated in introducing uh, to the audience, Travis Lowe, uh, you are in the semi-pro open uh, yeah. category. And in the Western circuit that you're in, you are now, uh, this, of the, as of this season, uh, you're in third, aren't you, in yes, overall points? That's correct. <clears throat> Let's talk about <clears throat> how you gain points for, uh, I, guess, I guess I should back up and say, let's, let's uh, enter Due to the audience, the geographical area we're talking about, where the racing takes place, and and about how many races that you would enter in one season, and when the season starts and when it closes out. Yeah, you get points um, the beginning of each circuit, and they'll have two or each series. They'll have two to three series, maybe per winner, depending on how many races they want to put in a series. Um, the one that I am currently taking third in, they have six races in, and you get points, like you're saying, as far as how you finish each race, how you qualify. Um, those points are added up each race, and then at the end of the series, your points are added and according and to. And then in place. How many, uh, let's suppose there's 15 in, um, in racing in a, in a series. Do they, how, many point, how many places down do they give points? They'll place all the way um, to the end as far as how many racers they were entered. They just go as the first place person will get 50 points, and then it will drop down four points to the second place, four points to the third place. So it goes down four, increment of four each time. Increment of four down to eighth place, and then after that they go increments of two. 
Okay. Until there's no more people left. So if you're finishing in first, second, or third in that area up there, that really <clears throat> adds the points up for yeah, you. Yeah. If you can be consistent in the top in the top group. Mm -hmm. um, now tell us a little bit about uh, when the season starts and when it closes out. I had my first race. Um, boy, I can't think of the exact date. It was the end of November, and I know that the my last race is the first weekend in April. So. Okay. And of course, that's contingent upon having snow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, even when it's a poor, it's been a good year for snow, hasn't it? Yeah. The, the snow really levels have been high. But even in a poor year of snow, there are still certain locations where those races can take place on higher altitudes. Yeah. And a lot of ski resorts will have races. Um, a lot of them that have snow machines will put on races after the ski resorts have closed. Then they'll try to get that extra little bit of income and yeah, you, race afterwards. You have a. You do bring in quite a few people in one yeah. of those races. Um, tell us about how uh, the geographical area covers. What states do you usually race in? I mainly race in Idaho, Montana, Washington. We do quite a bit of racing in Wyoming. We have raced in Oregon, just mainly the western, northwestern states. Sometimes have you raced also in Nevada? In yeah, your, uh, we have raced in there, yes. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about, I know I saw some footage we're going to show a little later, but uh, saw you racing in um, uh, Wyoming and, and, and McCall, Idaho, I believe is one of them mm -hmm. that, I, that I viewed. Uh, talk about how they prepare the racetrack. It's not like you have to build a permanent racetrack <laughs> somewhere like you do for automobile racing. They'll usually go in a week, sometimes two weeks before the race is held with a groomer, and they'll push all the snow into the main um, area that they'd like to have the track so there's kind of a, an extra buildup of snow and then about a week before the race is held they'll go through and build the track as far as the jumps and the corners that way as the week t coming up to the race they, uh, the sun will hit melt the snow and it'll kind of harden down the track so it'll stay a little harder you know through the race yeah, you want a quite hard track, yeah, don't you? Yeah, Otherwise no, you'd just get bogged down. Yep, a snowmobile will eat it up pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And then between the races, they have a, it gets a little bit like ice hockey, they have a, they come out and smooth the ice on <laughs> yeah. ice hockey. You, they have a, a machinery where they come and they, they what, what would you describe as how they uh, smooth out the track? Yeah, a groomer, again? they'll just, yeah, basically what you said, just take down all the bumps that they don't want to be there that they think could be a hazard if, someone you know would hit too fast or you know just safety reasons they'll take down some of the bumps. And they do that between each race do they? Um, not necessarily between each race just whenever they feel that it creates a um, problem when it's unsafe you know and it's too bad then they'll go through but towards the end of the day they'll like you're saying go through about every race and smooth it out. Now <clears throat> From at least the video I have seen, there is it's in like a kind of a circle that the racetrack is, and you'd you'd have a number of laps in that in the race. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, a number of laps according to uh, what category you're racing in, as far as sport, semi-pro, or pro, um, ladies. They have their amount of laps that they can run. The juniors. You know, that was my next question, and that was that. Uh, do you? As you deal with these different categories like semi-pro and <coughs> open and then the pro and all, is, are, are there age uh, requirements in any of those categories? No, there is no age requirements. If you're under 18 you have, and you want to race in the sport, the semi-pro or the pro, you have to have a parent's signature. But uh, they have classes for junior riders. They have different categories through there. They have three different brackets for if you're under 18. They have them for ladies. There's two or three brackets for ladies also. I saw yeah. some of your footage when they just like little tots looked like they were yeah. racing on those and of course they have a lot different uh, technique and, and slower and all that. Mm -hmm. Now as you enter these different uh, contests uh, I've noticed that some of them are that the snowmobiles are going around and just you know, like a car they don't leave the surface and all or, or hopefully you don't. But I noticed in other races where you're actually there, there's jumps or something where the snowmobiles kind of leap up over little hills. Is it so? Every uh, are there different kinds of races in, in the sense of what uh, the terrain's like? Yeah, a lot of them. Yeah, they try to. Each um, series tries to bring you a broad variety of uh, 
racetracks. You know, they don't try to get all of them, like you're saying, that are flat with no jumps. They like to have flat ones, and they like to have some with jumps, you know, so you can try to break up um, different styles of riding. And, and show, test your different skills. Yeah. I know some of the riders are actually, you know, they stand up on the motorcycle as they're leaving. Do they have just contests where it's just about, to, where they kind of take off of jumps and... Uh, yeah, they have a freestyle contest where um, people, they man-made jumps and riders actually go out and try tricks, you know. And they're, they're not running around to see who comes in first, but they're just... No. It's a little bit like, uh, I suppose it'd be like in uh, gymnastics or in swimming where people are, it's, it deals with the freestyle and, and they get points for their performance. Yep, yeah, you get points, exactly, you get points. And I don't know, um, as far as the points, how they do that. Because you're not, no. you don't do that. I think this is a great time uh, to uh, run the video. Our audience, I'm sure, is uh, interested. I think it's about a three-minute video we're going to run, and, and we'll be uh, quiet during that time and let you hear the, the noise of the race and, uh, and to see it. So if our staff this time will, will run that video, we would th appreciate that fact. Travis, that is, that is so exciting. I, I, I was never exposed to this until I met you and you started telling me about it. And I want to give your mother credit. Your mother is your cameraman, isn't yeah. she? And she, she, gave, she shared that video with us. Um, it's really exciting. And I have to say from an energy uh, and conservation viewpoint, it's not really that um, consuming of energy. Uh, tell us a little about you. You'll race almost all day on just uh, how much uh, fuel do you need? Mm, I could go all day on about two gallons. I take five gallons and that'll last me all weekend, so. Even though the, the snowmobile will hold more than that, you want to keep it as light as possible too, because that yep. helps with the race, doesn't it? Exactly. So race an entire weekend on five gallons, or maybe less. Mm -hmm. A little less even, yeah. Uh, for 
everyone concerned with energy, and I wanted to make that point yeah. that it's not uh, it's not consuming like automobile races, of course, consumes an awful lot of fuel and gas. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, the preparation. It's a lot of work, though, and, and I want to indicate that I mentioned that your mother goes along and she does the video, and we have some more video next week, and uh, I hope our viewers will be with us then. Uh, uh, your mother goes with you all, most of the time, I think, and your father, and you have a brother that's been a racer, and, yep. and he and his wife, and so it's a, it's a beautiful way for a family to spend um, really the, almost the whole winter. I know that your, your family works, and you go to school during the week, and then your weekends are taken up. Uh, tell us some more about that, How, and, and the kind of preparations, and, and that there's a lot of paperwork and, and applying, and, and uh, just share how this is a family effort. Yeah, we spend a lot of time, um, like you're saying, I wouldn't be able to do it without my family. Uh, my mom, she puts in a lot of the entry forms. Each race takes an entry form, what classes you want to race in. You also have to write down your sponsorships and some information about you. And that takes up quite a bit of time. Also, the majority of the time through the week is spent working on sleds, getting prepared for each race. As far as there isn't one track that's identical to the other, you're always having to change something on your sled to make it run better for each race site so you're constantly mechanicing on them. Um, not to mention just getting ready for the trip, you know, you, you're on the road quite a bit so you're constantly, you know, uh, mm -hmm. trying to keep up on your schoolwork and... And even just the, the little simple things, repairing uh, your clothes and all for the weekend trip. Yeah. Uh, tell us, and, and I've also seen some video on that, tell us not only about your but other racers the kind of uh, vehicle that you take your, your uh, snowmobile in and uh, just share with us, that there's a, it's an expensive thing in that mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, we, uh, we travel in a motorhome, it's a 32 foot four winds and then we have an enclosed trailer that we haul our sleds in that way um, for each race we can mechanic on them and you're not out in the weather working. A lot of people will just take a regular pickup with a trailer, um, it gets a little bit better fuel mileage. Um, the main reason we take a motorhome is we lose the expense of renting a hotel room and having to go out to eat dinner and everything. We just pack it all and just kind of camp out at the race site and mm -hmm. uh, spend some time together. And uh, you, you often take more than one uh, uh, snowmobile, don't you? Yeah, we almost always take three for sure too, but yeah, we're <clears throat> Excuse me, I race two all the time, but yeah, we'll occasionally take a third one as far as for yeah. spare parts. If, and for spare parts and problems that you might have. I was going to ask that question, and you've already addressed it, and that is that um, you uh, have very different tracks. Uh, that happens in car racing, too. Mm -hmm. I, I've always played tennis, and, and tennis courts are really different, how they're surfaced, and some are faster, and some are slower, and, and it can have an effect upon the strategy for your game. So uh, golf courses that obviously people play different golf courses because they have different challenges. So um, of those different tracks that you've raced on around the Northwest, what has been one of the two of the most challenging ones for you? I'd have to say Hagen, Montana, which is located on the east side of Lookout Pass. And it's just a really long track and has a lot of jumps. Um, just real technical as far as a lot of strategy you can ra use while racing, and it takes a lot of endurance out of you, you know. Whereas some others are easier. Stamina. Yeah, yeah, they're all, each one of them is a challenge, you know. They're, they have different features that makes them hard, but that one would be probably one of my hardest. Now, if you go in at, uh, well, since you're in school now, you can't get there much early, but can you get a chance to, try it on the track before you have to race or do you just have to? No, they'll, uh, some sites will um, furnish a test track that will allow you to see kind of what the area is like and, but then no, they don't ever let you ride on the track. So you're just on the track and you start discovering the challenges mm -hmm. as you're, you're racing? Yeah, and it changes throughout the day, the track will change as far as the snow conditions and the, the way the track is set up, it'll, it's, ne it's constantly changing, it never stays the same. You've brought with you, and it's here on the table, and the cameras will get it, but let's take, go through some of the equipment that you have that you have to wear for safety purposes. Okay, yeah, this is all just um, the basic requirements that you have to have. It's uh, knee pads here, 
eyes. To protect your knees. Yeah, they go on your shins and knees and they kind of Velcro around your calf. And they usually go underneath your snow pants. Um, and then I have a helmet here. You have to have a full face guard. You can't have, you know, it cannot be open. Isn't that, isn't that very similar to the automobile racers kind of hats? Yeah. Are? It looks, yeah. like, it looks as sturdy to me as what they were. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have some type of orange in the back, like I have here. Mine really isn't a safety orange, but why, why do I have orange. Use, why do they require orange? For, in case it's a real gray day and if there's a lot of snow okay. dust being brought up, for, you know, a racer in front of you or something, and you fall off, you want to be visible by another racer so they can't hit you. And orange is about the best color it is to show yeah. up in those situations, isn't it? Yeah, like I said, this isn't exactly the safety orange, but it's... What, what I have, so. And then I have a chest protector here. Can we move the hat so you can back out of the way? So I'd put it over there here you. if you don't mind, and then you, then you can show them the other jack so the camera can get a good shot of that. And this is what they call a tech vest. Um, it just basically goes around um, your shoulders and chest, zips up in the front. Um, a standard motorcycle um, chest protector will not work for the main reason that they are afraid a track spinning will catch the plastic and pull it off. This is um, a tech vest they call it and it you can kind of see how it's well padded. Yeah and it's like you're saying padded and a track with ice cleats won't r rip it right off you. It'll kind of stay there a little longer. Um, and, and so you have to uh, 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 turn around yeah, and the back of well, the number is missing but I want everybody to know that you're number 124. Yeah. You have a, a green uh, snowmobile and, and there's big signs on it that says 124. You can follow the, your favorite racer through those numbers. And you keep that same number everywhere you go, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. kind of. When you're in, entered in a series and you get a number like 124, that's you stick with it throughout the series. Okay. And then I have a jersey here. And it... Uh, that's the front, and here's the back. It I also. I want you to hold up and let me see the name. There you go, low 124. Oh, it also good. has to have safety orange on the back, covering 75% of your back, as far as also another feature for safety reasons, um, mm -hmm. protection. Safety right. orange, it's supposed to be. So, so, those who are in charge of this organization and all the races, they, they inspect to make sure that all the yeah. racers are following the rules and the. And the proper equipment. Yeah, and if you don't have them, then you more than likely won't be able to race. You'll uh, you'll be disqualified. Uh, there's this organization. You have the points, and I think Travis, it's not long to where you're not going to be in the semi-pro, but you're going to be in the <laughs> pro. Uh, you've done very very well, and uh, tell us a little about you know who runs the organization, and uh, uh, it's a nationwide organization, it's my understanding. This one, yeah, is um, a lot of just private individuals that have got together to form it. Do they have a board, a governing yes, board? Yes, they do. Um, like like a, a, some other sports association? Yeah, and they're uh, yeah, basically based out of the West Coast, like you're saying. They mainly stay around here as far as the races. But there are some races in other parts of the country. Yeah, they're all over. There's lots and lots of different circuits. It's, I mean. They got little ones, and this is one of the biggest ones on the West Coast. There. Okay. Now, you can go from one circuit to another one if you want to. Do they do they have uh, these points you have are in in your circuit that you're in? But do they have points that they gather nationwide uh, as a, as people are racing their circuits? Like you know, and, and again, certain types of car racing. There's at the end of the year, there's a champion from all those different. Uh, of course, they move around to different races around the country. But uh, are you just receive points from your circuit and it doesn't apply anywhere else. Yeah, you just receive points from each circuit and like you're saying, it never really applies. Well, the day will come when they'll... Yeah. It, it's it's kind of new, isn't it, sport yeah. in the sense that um, it'll de probably develop into a national point system. Um, tell us, you started when you were about, what, about 16? Yeah. So you've been racing for what, about five years? Yeah, six years, exactly. Oh, six years? Yep. Okay. Um, now let's talk a little bit, we don't have a lot of time to show, we'll, next week we'll talk about some other things. I really want to talk about some philosophical questions with you about you know, why you do this and all, but we'll wait next week. That's my carrot to my yeah. viewers for them to come back next week. But um, before we get into that uh, at the next program, um, tell us a little bit more about sponsorship. 
Uh, do you have any sponsors at this time? Yeah, I do. Um, Arctic Cat is the main sponsor. And then my local dealer, Curly Sales and Service, um, CNA Pros, Skis, um, Stud Boy Traction Products, and then Excess Disposal in Pretty Sure of Idaho. They're uh, all my sponsors, and they kind of contribute anywhere from products to uh, money donations. It's all kind of whatever they can contribute to help. Uh, and so on the national level, uh, 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 maybe I shouldn't say that way, but, but when one moves into the, just the pro circuit, instead of semi pro circuit, then there's some uh, rather large uh, sponsors, aren't there, uh, big companies? Yeah, you can get, um, as far as factories from the snowmobile, snowmobile factories, they'll give you a full sponsorship, and that'll be your job is to race. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what they get paid to do. And then you can even move down as far as aftermarket companies will pay you to race for them. And just What are some of the big co snowmobile companies that are involved in sponsorships? It would Arctic Cat, Polaris, uh, Skidoo, Yamaha, those are the main ones. Now, Articat is the one that's giving you some sponsorship. Now, yeah. if you move into the other one, there's a good chance they would be maybe your sponsor. Yeah, just kind of, they, uh, they'll they pick you up depending on how you do for each race. And yeah, you can switch sponsor to sponsor depending on which one will give you the best offer or. Even from know, one part of the season, you don't have to wait till the season's over. No, you can, you can move any time. Mm -hmm. And um, do they provide a, uh, the snowmobile itself or? Yeah, they will to certain racers, um, mainly pros, they'll furnish a snowmobile. Mainly they will just help you as far as with your parts that you need. They'll give them to you for cost or, you know. Those kind of things. Go that way. Well, Travis, the, I can see the clock. You can't. So yeah. The clock always wins on this program, and we're out of time on our first show. But uh, the good news is you're coming back next week so we can go into more detail about uh, cross-country snowmobiling and racing, which... Uh, one of the things I'd like to ask next week is, um, you know, how long has this circuit been uh, in operation? And, and again, as I said already, we're going to talk about why you do this and what it means to you and, and a number of philosophical questions at that time. But again, I want to take time on this program to congratulate you for uh, the fine season that you're having. And we're taping this program in um, March, so you're still in your season mm -hmm. as we're taping. It'll run later. But again, congratulations on being third and good luck for the rest of this season. And, and I'm just very optimistic that you're going to be going into the pros themselves. Again, congratulations. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to be with us again next week when Travis Love will be our guest talking about cross-country snowmobile racing. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest-running entirely college-produced program on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us again at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Public Forum, a community outreach program produced by North Idaho College located on Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart in welcoming today's guest. I am very pleased to welcome you back to the second week of our two-week series that is addressing cross-country snowmobile racing. Our guest last week was Travis Lowe, and he's back again to be with us this week. And for you who were not with us last week in the audience, uh, we showed some videotape. We'll show some different type of videotape this week about this sport and, and how it's catching on, and particularly here in the Northwest, where we have a, an abundance of snow some years in which that makes the sport a, a great success. And um, I think the day will come when it will be very much like uh, automobile racing. It will have a lot of fans and, and, and will be uh, enjoyed by many. Uh, Travis, welcome back to the program from last week. We had a great time and thank, thank you for spending this time with us. Uh, 
for those who didn't view it, let's just go back a little bit and talk for a moment about the Rocky Mountain Cross Country Racing Circuit. Uh, it's here in the Northwest, is that correct? Yep. Just tell us a little bit about what, where it is, the geographical area, and some of the places where you race, and the, like the number of contestants you have at most of these races. Um, we have anywhere, it's based out of um, Southern Idaho, but the races, they vary from, um, we raced in Northern Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Nevada, we've raced in Northern California, um, all over, and about the number of racers kind of varies. There's an average of about 170 riders per race. I have anywhere from 30 to 50 riders in my class that I race in, um, just kind of depending on where the race is at and what ones they can make it to. And in a season that starts in somewhere in November and goes to the beginning of April, how many races? Uh, I should add that you've been doing this now for about six years, mm -hmm. and that how many races would you enter on uh, average year? Uh, we've hit probably anywhere from twelve to sixteen, around in there. But say so take one of those twelve or sixteen, and it's a weekend. And so, how many in in that weekends? I assume you're counting. 12, 16, like weekends. Mm -hmm. So how many times would you race during that weekend at that site? Say you would go to McCall, Idaho, that's one of the tracks. Uh, how many times would you race during that weekend? I'd race nine times on Saturday and eight times on Sunday. So you the, take, say, 17 times you'd race, times 12 or 16 weekends, so that's a lot of racing. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna ask you some questions I ask you over lunch. <laughs> This is not uh, your livelihood. In fact, you, at this point, you're a college student, and after you're out of college, you'll, you'll have some occupation. And I guess we can call this a, a hobby, but a, a, a fun one and a time-consuming one. Um, there are many people that um, do things like um, they skydive or automobile racing. Of course, that can be for a living, and uh, snowmobile racing and downhill skiing. There's a lot of different things to do, rock climbing. Um, for people who do that, who are very active, uh, they live just a little bit on the edge. And I said that to you the other day. And would you be so kind as to share with our audience uh, about one's inner self that causes some individuals to work in, in nature in a way that's, from a physical viewpoint, is uh, it has some risk involved? Uh, just share with us where that's coming from and why you do it. Yeah, it becomes an addiction, like you're saying. You've done it, and like you do it weekend after weekend, and it becomes an addiction and a habit. You know, you have to have it the next weekend. If you stay home and watch TV, you're you're bored. You got to be doing something with your snowmobile. Um, it's just an addiction, I guess. You you've done it for so long that you, when you're without it, you have to have it. And, you know, just to get that adrenaline rush and to be there. There's a certain kind of thrill from it all? Yeah, yeah, there's a definite thrill when you're out there. Both you and your mother said this to me concerning these philosophical questions I'm asking you. Uh, and you had shared with her what you had shared with me, and that is that we all have responsibilities, and, and a lot of it's pleasant, but there are things that, are, that wear on one, you know, and, and, and everyone has some pressure in life. And so talk about... As a student, you have pressure. You have to take exams, and, and you worry about all your assignments and reading. Uh, talk about how this is an escape. Yeah, it is definitely an escape. For those eight laps that you're out there, you don't have to worry about the test that you're going to have to take on Monday, or you don't worry about anything in your real life, I guess you'd say. You just you worry you know, strictly about racing, and it's kind of an escape, I guess. So. Absolutely, your mind mentally and emotionally has to be concentrating on nothing but that race at that yeah. moment and trying to win and also being safe. Um, now, in relation to that, I, uh, I've watched video and we're going to have some on the show today. And I was watching you, and in fact, some video that we won't be showing, <laughs> and I got a kick out of it. You're out in the field and you're just playing <laughs> around, and you, there's another friend of yours on another motorcycle, and you're up and you're down on, on your snowmobile. and and uh, I even saw you jumping off and letting it go, and you're catching up with it. 
you reminded me of, uh, in a very positive way, of uh, a kid playing for a mm -hmm. while, you know. And, and so is that part of your weekend too? In other words, yeah. when you're doing that, you're also, I would assume, not worrying too much about other duties and responsibilities? Yeah, just to have fun. That's basically all what it's about. It's all you can mainly get out of it at the end is fun, you know, and memories of where you've been and what you've done. So it's kind of, yeah, an escape and fun also just to ride around. You're very, very good at it. And I've, I've, I've watched both the races and, and, and this play that you're doing. And, and you, you'll you stand up on the snowmobile and, and you'll lean and you'll sit down. And, and I was watching that something came to me. And, and I think when I said that to you the other day, I, at least the nonverbal was that maybe I, I'd said something you hadn't thought a lot about before. And that is, I thought of like uh, uh, great dancers or, or people who are in the, you know, the arts and the theater. There's an art to things in sports as well as in, in, the, in the theater and all. Uh, so I'd like to get your response uh, uh, as I was the other day. There's an art to this, isn't there? Yeah, there's a definite art. Um, you have to be one with the snowmobile, know what reaction is going to happen from the thing that you're faced with. And it's, yeah, you have to know exactly what's, what's going to happen, what you're confronted with. Uh, explain a little bit what you mean, one with the snowmobile. You have to know, a, I mean, you have to know a definite feel as far as um, how it's going to react in certain situations, jumping off of a jump, how it's going to react, landing, how it's going to react, you know. There's different, I guess keep saying reactions, for each step you take, you know, you just... It's, and, and with time, do you, you know, you just get better and better. That's why you move from like semi-pro to pro. And you learn not only about moves on the track and all, but I would assume you even like being one with the snowmobile that you, even your body movements all can improve and change. Mm -hmm. Like a dancer practicing becomes a better dancer. Yep. You just keep, each time you're out there playing, you might not realize it, but every time you try something and you push yourself, you're learning that much more and you're gaining that much con more control over the snowmobile. You know, you're getting a better feel for it, and you just keep stepping up to the next, next level, I guess. You probably haven't read this book, and I, I, I may not have the title exactly right, because <clears throat> a long time ago I read it. Was it's the, the Zen of motorcycle. Uh, I've got I got that exactly the title right, but uh, this book is about a, a, a man and his motorcycle across the country, and, and, and how Zen or or getting in touch with yourself and your inner self, worked a, a machine with a human. Um, so that's that's part of what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and it sounds funny, but you even find yourself talking to it sometimes <laughs> when you're racing. You know, you well, definitely me, become one. You know, give me an example of what you might say to the motorcycle. <laughs> not good things sometimes, but oh, you know. sometimes you you're lecturing <laughs> yeah. the motorcycle because not, yeah. I mean, not the motorcycle. In this case, the snowmobile, it's not doing what you want it to. Exactly, but a lot of times it's good. You know, you're just talking to yourself. You know, but sometimes you're more happy with the machine than others, depending yeah. how it's performing. You know, uh, one escape traps would be to blame the snowmobile yeah. for some mistake that one might make themselves, <laughs> right? Um, in your conversation with other participants, uh, how do they react to what they're doing? Do, are most of them as dedicated as you and go almost every weekend, uh, the same people on the track? Yeah, you really become um, close in that with the people you race against. You see them every weekend, you know, you can talk to them and stuff. And the one, you can tell the ones that are dedicated on their performance on the track, you know, when they hit races weekend after weekend, just being there, each race you learn something new, um, and it they, you, know, you improve compared to the people that don't miss a race, and you know, off and on, the people that are there every week definitely That's improve. The best. Yeah, you can just being there, you learn something new every time. I assume you have a real respect for one another, even when you're not finishing first, you admire the, like yeah. in, a, in a great tennis match, if you're playing a match and someone, it's a close match and they defeat you, you can have great admiration for, or they have a particular shot that's just so beautiful and you'll say, congratulations, mm -hmm. that was really, really good. Yeah, you do. So that's a kind of respect. I'm gonna pause this time and ask our staff to put up the video. Uh, I know our viewers would like to see some more. And in this particular video, there'll be some um, finish line we'll see. And then at the end, we'll see what your machine looks like, the snowmobile, it's a <coughs> kind of complicated machine. So I'll ask them to run the, the videotape at this time.
Travis, that was so great to have that video. I want to talk about it a little while. And now that our viewers have seen it, you know, they can really identify with what the questions are. As you were going around that, and, and I, at the beginning I said, there goes number big 124, which is your number. Uh, and I saw you going around there, and, and, and your, your snowmobile is green. And, uh, you know, one of my visuals about this before seeing video is that it would be a very, always a very smooth track, like this table, very flat, mm -hmm. and you just go around and around, and, but it isn't. There's um, little hilly aspects to it, and I know you'll be going along at some point, and it'll, you know, you'll be very much on the snow, but then you come up on this and it kind of jumps over a hill. So uh, talk a little about what kind of thrill that is and, and, and the control that would be necessary. I noticed I saw you uh, occasions you're going, sometimes that you're rising up off of the snowmobile. That's part mm -hmm. of the balance, I suppose. So uh, guide me in my ignorance on this process. Uh, just tell us how, how that works in relation to that track and how the different turns and moves. And well, you want to, uh, of course, you know, to be the fastest, you want to try to find the smoothest line, but not always that you can do that. So you want to try to find jumps where you can jump from one to another, so you're not always going in and out of one, you know, slowing you down. So if you can jump better, go. you'll you'll skip over some of that down yeah. part to the next hill. Mm -hmm. And as far as um, the corners, just trying to find the fastest spot where there isn't another rider. That's another problem you'll run into also is if you have a slower rider in front of you. But the corners, back to them, um, just as far as the fastest line you feel you can get around them. You know, if you can hit the berms high or take it real low. Um, so after one trip around, or maybe it's, maybe it's from sight, but at least one trip around, you learn very quickly since you don't get a chance to practice on the track mm -hmm. like in some sports. But you, um, you real quickly, is it, is it from just eyesight or, or, or the feel that, you, how do you know what's the fastest part of that? that if you're you trying can, to get in a more fast yeah. aspect to pass others. The one real easy way, other than just visual by yourself looking, is to watch the rider in front of you. If you have a faster rider that's pulling away from you, find out, follow him for a lap, find out what lines he's taken and where he's going faster than you, and then what lines you're taking that you're going faster than him, and then you can put them together, and you know you can try to find the fastest one, I guess. But so uh, your opponent can help you out with by yeah, watching them closely, and that's the key too. Sometimes it's not necessarily to pass the guy right off the bat and take the lead, but to, if you're in second or third or whatever, to follow him for a while and figure out where you can, you are faster than your opponent at, and. A key, key moment to make your move. Yeah, exactly. Because if you pass them too early, then he can follow you and find out where you're going at. You know. So timing is really important. Yeah. And that last lap or so is when if it is a key to passing. Yep. Them. And that's when a lot of stuff goes on. I noticed there on, on the video too. There was a lineup uh, of all the as there is like in automobile racing, where you're starting off. You all can't be on the very front <laughs> line, can you? How? Do, what determines the placement of the snowmobiles? you'll have three qualifying races and they'll break up the class because you'll have up to 50 riders per class and you can't of course fit all of them on the track right. so they'll break that up into what they call heats which is qualifying of 10 riders per heat and they'll have up to three heats and however you qualify you get points you, you, qual you do three heat races and you add up your points for all three of them uh, the person with the highest number of points qualifies first, then you can choose where you want to line up for the main event on the front line. So and there's how many is on the front line usually? Ten. And so but of the ten of you, whoever's the best gets the first spot and then the all the way down place through, will pick. all the way through not ten. Yep. Now is there, it, and there's never more than ten, is it like a line up? You don't no. have a back row or something? Yes, you do have a back row, oh, you do? four people. Yep, you have ten on the front and then the... Four pe then they take 14 people to the main event and the people so you'd last have, four. So you'd have a line of back. 10, another line of 10, and a line of 4? No, a line of 10 and then a line of 4, so there's 14. 14 total. Yeah. Never more than 14. No. Okay. So the trial heats are important too. Yeah. You're in a good position, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Um, how about safety? Uh, I hope they're not injuries. Uh, they're, they're not the type of injuries there in automobile racing, is there? No, there's a lot of... Um, broken legs is what because you know that um, you're on your legs endurance a lot and if you fall off yes there's a lot of broken legs um, 
they're basically a lot of injuries, the same as a bull rider, I guess. As far as but the snowmobiles aren't, there's not much of colliding into one another, snowmobiles are there? There's a little bit, but not, no, not a whole lot. Not know. the same yeah, level yeah. of pileup in the Yeah, you really don't want to because you only hurt yourself if you sure. wreck, you know. Sure. Uh, have you ever had any injuries? No, I haven't, knock on wood, not mm -hmm. snowmobile. Well, congratulations, six years. and Yeah. I know in our other conversation you've talked about safety is really important to you, not hurting anyone else or yourself. Mm -hmm. um, now, as, as you do these races and uh, you move up or you can slip back from weekend to weekend, we're doing this program on a Friday. You've been so generous coming Friday. Are you racing this weekend? Yes, I am. You're leaving from here and yeah. where, do you, where do you go? We are going to Missoula, Montana. So is your family meeting you here in Coeur d'Alene? Yeah, they are, right after this. Right after this, and then you're going to go right on to Missoula. Yeah. Uh, you, you, we should tell our viewers that you live in Idaho, but not in Coeur d'Alene. No. You live in Priest River, right? And so and you commute there to come to college. You know, I thought, college, I want to college to get some credit, you know, that, you're, yeah. that you're going to school here. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about um, something that's very important in life is... Uh, having support in whatever you do. And, and last week we talked a little bit about your family, but I want to delve a little further into that. And I just had a wonderful conversation with your mother this <laughs> week, and she's very proud of you, you know, and, and rightly so. And um, by being together on the weekends like that, and you have one brother, and, and he's married, and he has one child, and, yep. and your mother and dad. Tell us what this means for your family to be together like this. Yeah, and it uh it means a lot to everybody, you know. It's uh, everybody is very committed to it, and uh, we, I don't think we'd be able to do it if one person dropped out. I mean, it's just a real. You know, everybody has to pitch in. You're all so close, and yeah. such much love. But I do have to have you tell this story. Your mother won't mind. <laughs> <laughs> you were down in Wyoming, I believe, when President Bush was there, and uh, tell. What your mother did and then how you accidentally <laughs> caused a problem. Well, she spent all weekend uh, filming the race so we could take it in here. And she had two days straight of just filming and had a lot of good coverage. And I, uh, Sunday night, was sitting in the hotel room. We were staying in the hotel that weekend. And I wanted to watch it, so I rewound the video camera so I could watch it. And watched about a minute of it, and it was too small, so I didn't want to view any more of it and push stop Well, she went to record the next time and recorded over all of it. There was none left. She record, now hadn't she got some photographs of the, or, or not photograph, a video of the President's uh, yeah, Air, uh, Force, one Air Force One in. flying in and, and because of what you did it got, <laughs> yeah. it got erased and uh, uh, that's, that's a, such a cute story. I just I wanted to sh have you share that. So those little accidents will happen <laughs> you know, uh, in relation to that. Um, so you have how many more races this season? Four more. Four more. Yeah. Now the season's coming to an end because <laughs> yeah. we're here on the 15th day of March, and and I know in the summertime you you, you have well you have other work you do and responsibilities, but tell me how you deal with the off season. You know because you, you've already said on the show last week that you know you get such a high from this and it's so energizing and and it's an addiction, but actually the majority of the months you don't get to race. So mm -hmm. how do you deal with life and in the off season? Well, I spend a lot of time working to pay for the race and have it, I guess. And uh, other than that, just spend a lot of time boating and do a lot of foreland. Um, been trying to do a little bit of motorcycling, just trying to stay in shape, but just um, a lot of work, I guess, you know, to pay for it. Is yeah, because it's all expensive. It's very expensive, yeah. Very expensive. And, and, but did you say you do um, uh, boating in the summertime too? Yeah, yeah. With we the beautiful do a lot lakes that we have. So that, again, you're just you're a very active person. So yeah. that gives you another way of, of, of being active. Also, it's your work, and oftentimes you think about, um, you know, that's, this is your favorite thing that, that motivates you, saying, well, I, this money is going to help me next season. That's what you think about every day when I'm working, yeah. <laughs> now, when the day comes that you don't um, do this anymore, I, I don't know if you're giving that much thought or not, but uh, someday you won't be snowmobiling. And, how can you stay in, well your brother now uh, he's I believe a fireman and, he, and he's yeah, married and garbage so, man, yeah and so he um you know is not racing to the extent you are uh but talk about that just a little bit how he helps you you know this way of keeping 
involved in a sport like this? He, uh, he mechanics for me. He does all my mechanicing. And actually, I probably wouldn't be able to race if he wasn't there just because I couldn't keep up. I mean, he he's probably half of what I've accomplished this year just as far as setting up the sled and helping me to get to each race, you know, week by week. It's a definite benefit to have him mechanicing. And having your family along, too, I assume that on the trip you don't do much driving. You, you rest because you have to be hmm. so physically prepared for the race itself. So they do most of the driving, would that be true? Yeah, yeah, my dad, he does all the driving. So, so that's his role. I, yeah, exactly. I'm glad to get dad in here because <laughs> when they see this video, we don't want to forget dad. We've talked about mother and your brother and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, in the short time we have left, let's go back to talk about the, the snowmobile, the tracks. And on the tape, it showed the machine. It's a kind of complicated machine and, and a significant size engine. And, and we showed the blades, I guess I'll call them that, Correct me if I'm wrong. The blades on the bottom. Yeah, uh, yeah, ice picks. Mm -hmm. Ice picks. What do you do to those, and how do you change those? Uh, because you said that they're different for different races or different uh, mm -hmm. tracks. The uh, the ice picks usually stay the same. Um, they can only be three eighths of an inch above the highest part of the lug on your track, which is the rubber piece that will go across. And they're a sixty degree point, um, no sharper. You can't have a sharpened pick. The uh, the carbides on the front, which turn or hook to the skis, those also can only be a 60 degree point, so they cannot be very sharp. Um, as far as the motor, that's always being changed week by week, as far as snow conditions, the elevation, the weather. You mean you it, know, it changes and how it'll fun how it operates yeah, because how, of the cold or whatever? Yeah, yeah, you're constantly having to change your, your setups just because of the different weather conditions, snow conditions, track conditions. Even when you get to track, you know already before you go the altitude and those kind of things, which will mm -hmm. change some. But when you get there, the weather conditions can be such that you have to make some adjustments even before the race. Yeah, yeah. Majority of all, the, yeah, all the time actually you'll have to make adjustments. And that's the kind of thing your brother does. For yeah, you. yeah. He does all that and he's pretty good at it. So, uh, in, in your success, uh, uh, when you're racing against other people, they may or may not have someone as, as well trained mm -hmm. as your brother to assist in that. So there's. There's a lot of complications of this whole process, isn't there? A lot of intricacies, and you already talked last week about your mother doing the, all the paperwork and, and uh, uh, signing you up for races, but also there are other things and, and getting information in. Uh, well, Travis, two weeks have gone by really yeah. fast, and we thank you for being here. I want you, you to extend not only um, our thanks to your family, but our congratulations for what they're doing, and in particular to your mother for this fine video. And, I know she was very anxious <laughs> about how it would work out, and it worked out beautifully. And, and so, which she could have been here with us today, but uh, she had other responsibilities and getting ready for your trip this weekend. Again, good luck this weekend. I hope you win. Thank uh, you. Our our th thoughts are with you, and and obviously we are biased in your favor in, in all these races. So uh, keep up the good work, and I I can say we'll see you back in school. Uh, <laughs> Not next week because it's spring break, but uh, after that we'll be back. And again, thank you for being on the program. We greatly appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking about cross-country snowmobile racing for the past two weeks and have really enjoyed interviewing Travis Lowe and congratulating him on his great success. And I'd like to invite you to be with us again next week at the same time. We will move to yet another issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running entirely college produced program on PBS. Each episode is pre recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us again at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.